I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than two dollars fifty per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Each new generation studies Napoleon through their own lens. So, in the nineteen sixties, it was all about his relationship to women and feminism, and then a little later, it was about his relationship to the economy in the nineteen eighties and nineties. And today, of course, we see him through the social justice lens. And the big questions of slavery come back, and colonialism come back, and his alleged racism and sexism. It's a great shame.、Uh, it's a great shame because, as my friend,、uh, another Napoleonic historian, Arthur Chevalier, has said, these people are not historians. The, the the activists who want us to stop talking about the man and the era, these are not people who spend thirty years studying sources. No, they're people who jump into the subject. Superficially, latch on to one controversial, one problematic aspect, and then tear him apart, and then they criticize us for being interested in his legacy. It's almost as if if you have a historical character whose one problematic opinion, one problematic action, it disqualifies everything else. Well, I ask these people: if that is the case, if that is the standard, if that is the conception we have of our own history, who exactly passes the test? Hello and welcome to the pod. And today's episode is on that great figure who gave his name to an era, Napoleon Bonaparte. I'm talking with Louis Sarkozy, Frenchman, historian, author, and a man passionate about the great French emperor, or Corsican ogre, delete as appropriate. We discuss his image today by some, as you heard at the top there. Louis has strong views, but also how Bonaparte is viewed by nations of Europe, his love of books and the ancients, and much more. I've got plenty more great episodes coming up, including the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, the history of the mafia, British ballet in the 1930s and during the war, and the Great Commanders series continues with Gordon as we chat World War One also rans. So please do subscribe, and if you can give me a five star rating, that would be joyous news. You can get in touch with me via the links in the show notes. But until then, I'll hand you over to myself and Louis Sarkozy discussing Napoleon. Louis Sarkozy, welcome! Thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure. It's a great pleasure for myself as well. Thank you for having me. Well, Louis, I've got you on to discuss. Well, we're here really to discuss the great man himself, Napoleon, which might seem strange coming from me, a Brit, but I am a I am a, a, a real admirer of Napoleon, and. That might come as a surprise to some of my French listeners, because Louis, I do have French listeners.、Uh, we have a bit of a love-hate relationship. I, I love them, and they hate me,、um, <laughs> because we've got episodes on Poitiers, Cressy, Waterloo. I won't go on; it'll upset you. But、um, sure. but、uh, I am a, an admirer of Napoleon, so I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to us discussing this. And the reason why we are is because you've written a book. At if you don't mind my saying, the tender age of twenty six, I think a book on Napoleon and and more specifically,、uh, it's titled Napoleon's Library, and it is all the books that you know Napoleon was a voracious reader, and so it's a great subject to write about. And、uh, I mean, I, I guess my first question is, did you write this because have there been many books written about Napoleon and his love of books and his love of reading? So thank you for the question. If I may just say、uh, right before answering your 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 very good question,、uh, I'm not surprised that you are a Napoleonic admirer. A lot of English people are. In fact, in England,、uh, there's probably the most well developed Napoleonic readership in the world after France.、Uh, for some reason, and this dates back to his lifetime,、uh, he has always inspired in England the fiercest hatred. And the most devout、uh, admiration. So famously, Lady Holland and her husband, chief of the opposition、uh, at the time of his decline and fall in eighteen fourteen, eighteen fifteen, loved Napoleon, sent him books 
on St. Helena, because famously in St. Helena, he had a lot of trouble getting books. This voracious reader who used to have access to these grand libraries no longer had access to them. So Lady Holland sent him books when he was briefly off the coast of England on the HMS Bellophorum. Uh, you had admirers uh, try to go see him that gathered on the pier. Uh, and of course, English shaders also wrote very admirative and respectful sea shanties in his honor, including a very touching one called Boney Was a Warrior. Uh, and these are people, mind you, who fought and died and suffered against him. And yet the shanties are deeply respectful, admiring, uh, and honorable. So I'm, I'm not at all surprised that in England, uh, there's still some admirers left. And some people in England have Napoleonic libraries and buy every book published on him, everything. So not surprised at all. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. I mean, I, I find the man fascinating. I mean, I can't compete with these people who have extensive libraries, but I mean, only recently we've seen, I don't know if you've got, there's a brilliant book recently written by Ruth Skur about Napoleon gardening throughout his life it's yeah. that's just an extraordinary angle and yours is a, a, an interesting angle as well so there's always despite thousands of books having been written about him there's always something new because he's such an interesting figure isn't he that's right uh there is just a mystery about him nobody has really been able in two centuries or so to crack the secret the guy was a total alien i mean just and, and there's this one really famous uh, and interesting quote. I forget where it is exactly or who he's talking to, but he makes this offhand comment. And he, he I think he's talking to a bunch of marshals and he says, uh, you know, but you people won't understand. And what, what does he mean by you people? Does he mean the marshals, the military people? No, I, I, I think and others think that he means all of humanity except him because <laughs> he was not normal. Uh, he probably had no friends. I mean, some people, of course, say, you know, he cried when Lan died. He cried when Duroc died. But he, he also makes, um, he gets over their deaths incredibly quickly. He doesn't really mourn. Um, we know he loved Josephine, but he seems to have gotten his heart broken uh, after the Hippolyte Charles affair that she has. And after that, probably never loves another one of his wives or mistresses. Um, fanatical work ethic. Reminds me of that quote that, that begins a, a recent biography of Charles de Gaulle, great men are crazy. And he very much was crazy. He was so all-encompassing, so polyvalent, so many aspects of his character, such a mystery, such an alien. So that's why, I mean, so much interest has been uh, stirred up on him. And he also achieved so much. I mean, his life story is barely believable. I mean, with this guy who comes from you know, low and unremarkable Corsican poverty in a backwater, Corsica, that was just annexed to the French crown, um, suddenly climbs the echelons, um, is general at 26, wins, you know, some of the most famous campaigns and battles in military history, becomes first consul, eff effectively, you know, complete ruler of France at 30, humbles Europe's greatest and oldest monarchies, um, rules the French people, creates the modern French state, harmonizes the legal codes, reforms all the institutions, rebuilds the sewers and the bridges, everything, and then loses everything <laughs> like in one lifetime. And he dies young. He dies at, at 60 or so. So the, to cram so much history into one life is bewildering. I mean, the, more stuff happened in the 15 years of his reign than occur in centuries in other countries. So the, the, his life is barely believable. I mean, it's stranger than fiction and it's completely understandable that it stirred up so much interest. I think there is, since his death, there's been a, back, a, a book and a half written per day since 1821, which rounds up to about 300,000 or so books. So that more books written about him than any other figure in world history, more than Jesus, more than Julius Caesar, more than Mohammed. I mean, he, he really is a, a, a mystery. Well, he's, it's one of the reasons why I put him on our new logo, because he is this sort of titanic figure. But I wondered, and I, I don't know, this might be a strange question, because there's lots of lots of books written and published in this country. And, and I wanted to explore this slightly, because do you think that other countries writing Napoleon get Napoleon? Or do you think, you know, there's there's a more interesting historiography in France because, you know, 
well, I guess he's Corsican, so that's an important factor we shouldn't shouldn't neglect. But do you think foreigners get Napoleon, or do you think it's really a sort of a French understanding that gets to the heart of what the sort of man he was? It's a very interesting question. Um, and what you find when you read uh, the historiography of different countries is that each country has its own Napoleon. And he plays a very different part, but a very important part in almost all cases in different countries. So in Russia, uh, he's known, and I, I, when I say he's known as, I don't mean, you know, the learned Napoleon historians, because you have some, some, you know, very high level historians in, in Russia and Austria, etc. But when it comes to the zeitgeist, to the general population, my understanding is that in Russia, he's regarded with some fascination, but of course, everything revolves around the failed Russian invasion, the sort of proto-Hitler. He's the first chapter before uh, what they call the Great Patriotic War, the, the Barbarossa, the, the Nazi invasion. Um, in Austria, he's seen as the great enemy in England as well. I mean, I was I just visited the, the chambers of parliament in Westminster yesterday, and, uh, and there's these two massive, ta beautiful tapestries one of the Battle of Trafalgar and the other of Waterloo. Uh, and of course, 1815 marks the real apogee of the British Empire and the start of the British century and complete unfettered domination of the seas itself. So it played a massive role in, in the English zeitgeist as well. In Germany, um, especially in the Prussian heartland, he is very much remembered for um, the 1806-1807 Prussian campaign, which was a massive humiliation uh, for Prussia, and in fact, um, the Junkers uh, never for forgave him, never forgot him, and all the animosity that was exemplified in the later years of his reign really date back to the 1806-1807 campaign, the humbling of Prussia, I mean, the complete disintegration of the Prussian army uh, within a campaigning season or two, uh, you know, the, the entire country falls. This to a proud militaristic nation was something very, very tough to swallow. So each nation has its own Napoleon. Um, again, when it comes to the general public's uh, understanding, the it guys. But when you go to you know university departments, uh, there's some wonderful work being done everywhere. Uh, I, I don't think French historiography is particularly uh, privileged in this way. Uh, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about that era is that the sources are readily available, and you don't have to dig very far to find them. I mean, this is one of the most well-documented epochs in, in in European and world history. Um, and just as 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 I did, I mean, I'm, I'm not a professional historian, uh, and it was perfectly easy to to try to enter these archives uh, and to try to dig and understand uh, at least uh, on a remote level what was going on. So no, I think there's wonderful work being done uh, everywhere. In this country, Napoleon's probably, I think he is. He is sometimes compared with Hitler, which I think is a, a bit of a ridiculous comparison, actually. I would say, but. He, he is certainly, I think, certainly viewed negatively, predominantly because of his desire to invade Britain, which never really happened due to the Royal Navy. But in the last few years, we've seen a number of books written. And I, and I know, uh, so Aspects of History, we've got huge fans of, of Adam Zamoyski, of Andrew Roberts, of course, Paul Strathern, have all written wonderful books on Napoleon. It, do you think the man himself would be... Uh, would this be a sort of a small victory for him post Waterloo, knowing that even today he's he's got some of the foremost historians in in this country writing, glowing uh, well sort of well certainly bestsellers about himself. I mean, he, would that give him a small smile? Do you think he would be delighted? He, he would he would love it beyond anything. Uh, and this is something I cover in, in the book. And, and by the way, I, I was absolutely graced and deeply touched because uh, Mr. Roberts is writing the foreword to my book. Uh, so this the, and, and his biography of Napoleon is a masterpiece. I mean, that's a coup to get a Andrew. He's fantastic. Oh, I, I'm, I'm retiring after this book. It's done. It's that's it. The peak has been achieved. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, deeply, deeply nice of Andrew uh, to to agree. His biography, of course, is absolutely um, inevitable. I mean, it, it is a wonderful work. Uh, and Napoleon would be delighted. The, the The last part of my book deals with Napoleon's last battle which is the one with posterity. Uh, and of course, uh, as so many other aspects of Napoleon's life, it's a book uh, that grants him that victory. So on St. Helena, he half dictates, half probably invented to the Count of Las Cases, the memorial of St. Helena, 
which becomes one of the best sellers of the 19th century and cements his legend. Now, of course, it's full of uh, imaginations and lies about how he really was, about his true politics. You know, he was not the liberal emperor and the nationalist, whatever. But nonetheless, that's the image he wants to send out there. He was deeply concerned with leaving this image to posterity. And he says himself, you know, he says that all my battles and all the crowns I wore uh, are nothing compared to the crown of thorns that England now makes me wear. He, he was completely aware of the martyrdom and the image it was going to grant him. So if we were to tell him that him who is obsessed with public opinion, obsessed with his image, obsessed with posterity, that two and a half centuries on in his arch nemesis country in England, historians are writing bestsellers. And you know, if you, as an author, as my publisher has told me, that subject always sells. It, it would be his crowning achievement. I mean, he would absolutely be delighted to hear this. Well, so Louis, not so fast. Before all my British listeners, you know, spill their cups of tea and, and are now angry that I'm praising Napoleon too much. Do you think part of the reason why he has a fascination in this country is because Napoleon never faced our great leader at the time, the Duke of Wellington, until Waterloo. Right. So he didn't fight in Spain where Wellington had a string of, of victories, dispatching a number of very talented marshals. Yes. And and at Waterloo, this is sort of the ultimate clash. And maybe partly the reason why we're, uh, we're keen on, we're, we're quite happy to be fascinated by Napoleon is that Waterloo was won by the Allies, I should say, with the help of the Prussians. But ultimately, the commander on the on the field that day was the Duke of Wellington. And so there is yeah. a kind of um, satisfaction knowing that we got one over Napoleon. And that is a fully uh, deserved satisfaction. And were I British, uh, instead of the Battle of Austerlitz sitting atop my desk, it would probably be the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, fully deserved. Of course, it is his victory. Uh, anybody who knows about the battle knows that he chose his ground perfectly well. Um, and that the Duke of Wellington is absolutely in the number one spot for receiving merit and credit for that victory. Having said that, this was no longer the 27-year-old, 28-year-old Napoleon he was facing. This was an aged Mike Tyson that got up in the ring. And he commits a series of mistakes which would be completely anathema and unrecognizable in the younger Napoleon. I mean, if you were to tell the Napoleon of Rivoli or the Napoleon of Marengo that you must wait until 10 or 11 a.m. for the ground to dry to start your attack, he would have, he would have, he would have clawed you in the face. He, this was the opposite of Napoleonic warfare with the emphasis on, on speed, surprise, initiative, action, completely contrary. He says, oh, we'll start at 10, 11, I'll have them by launch. He completely underestimates his enemy, something he very rarely did, completely underestimates British troops in general. He calls Wellington the sepoy general. Of course, just gross mistake. As, as you know, British troops were highly professional, much more professional than the Austrians, Prussians, and, and Russians that he was facing in, in previous campaigns. So Waterloo is a Wellington victory. It is undeniable. It is also a battle that he could have won and that Napoleon lost. I think had had a couple of things been different, and we can talk about if you'd like, or talk about the books maybe, uh, a couple of things been different that very much could have been won. But again, he wins Waterloo, fine. D disbands the Prussians, fine. It's funny because you get Dunkirk 130 years before Dunkirk, because now uh, the British army has to rush either to Calais or to Dunkirk to, to escape from the continent. But then you still have Schwarzenberg, you still have the Austro-Russians, you still have the Prussians, you still have an invasion from Spain. Uh, so would they have just pushed back the inevitable? Probably. Uh, Waterloo is, is seen as the end for good reason, but the truth is, had the outcome been different, I'm very dubious to know if you know, something of real substance would have changed in the 19th century. What would really have changed is if he accepted the uh, Copenhagen peace proposals of 1814, which were, I think, bring back the France to her 1796 or 1792 borders. That, that if he accepted that, uh, I mean, there'd be a good chance that the, the, the Bonapartist and the Napoleonic regime would have, would have survived. But, and I completely agree with you, by the way, that the comparison to Hitler is absurd has no basis in reality. 
uh, and his complete fabrication and a lie and a slander. And to a British audience, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Winston Churchill thought it was a lie and a slander, said we should never compare him to Hitler. Napoleon was the greatest man of action in, in Europe since Julius Caesar. So Churchill thought that was absurd. But at the end of the reign, they do have a rather um, sorry point in common, which is that they're completely unable to give up on recent conquests. Right. So Hitler is known, and Andrew Roberts also makes that point very, very clear in his history of the Second World War. Hitler was patently unable to accept even a tactical withdrawal from a conquest. He could never give up gain ground, even if it meant a long term benefit. We see this over and over again in the history, the military history of the Third Reich. He constantly tells his commanders, stand or die, when they perfectly could have pulled back, preserved the army. At the end of the reign, Napoleon seems to act in the same way. He, he, he thinks his legitimacy is so fragile and only built upon his battlefield victories that if they start to erode, he will have no legitimacy. I think at some point he says the Bourbons have a thousand years to legitimize their reign. I have nothing. I have a few victories. And so he's con constantly looking for the next big victory to re-legitimize his position on the throne. And when the British and Metternich and the Austrians and the Russians tell him, okay, give up the low countries, give up Italy, uh, give up the, um, the, the, the islands of the coast of uh, the Balkans, to him it's impossible because his legitimacy on the throne rests upon those conquests. So I'm afraid to say that I'm, I'm pretty convinced that's something that the two men have in common. It's probably the only thing that they have in common. No, interesting, interesting. So um, I just wanted to dwell into the, the subject of your book, really, because looking at Napoleon in his first campaign in Egypt, he was, I think, very much keen to emulate probably, well, certainly in my mind, another figure who features on the Aspects of History logo, uh, Alexander the Great, who to me is sort of the greatest. And I wondered his library of books I mean, he read vast numbers of books and the classics in particular in ancient Greece. What sort of um, ancient writers was he fascinated by? I assume he read them all because classical education was very much de rigueur in those days, particularly for educated people like Napoleon. But I, I'm very interested in, in the ancient writers, particularly ancient Greek writers that he was interested in. So you're completely right in saying that that was definitely part of the education at that time. However, he took it a step further. Uh, he was obsessed with history. He was an obsessive student and reader of history, particularly the ancients. In most of the libraries he created, he even separates sometimes in two categories, ancient history written by the ancients and ancient history written by the moderns. He has a particular fondness for the ancients. Two men, two authors particularly stand out, although there are, of course, many others. One, Plutarch. Plutarch is... The first book we hear about, it's the last book we hear about, the, the lives being, of course. He has it in every library. It's in every campaign library. He talks about it ad nauseum, obsessed, completely obsessed with Plutarch's lives, of course, particularly the lives of Alexander and the lives of Julius Caesar. And the second, the lives of the great captains of Cornelius Nepos. You see the trend here. He likes history as the ancients wrote it, meaning it's not the scientific economic study of ancient kingdoms and the peculiarities of trade. No, he likes the, ta the tales of weary illustres, great men, and their deeds and their valor to be emulated. And that's what he was taught when he was at Brienne, and that's what he read, and that's what he deeply loved. So Plutarch and Cornelius Nepos hated Tacitus. Hmm weird he he finds him smog he finds that his portrayal of nero is completely unjust napoleon suspected and it's funny because sometimes napoleon has these opinions that actually modern academia sort of seems to back i was about to say yes exactly and and despite you know obviously him not having access to modern uh, historiography so he suspects tacitus of having a, a as the french say a wrong tooth for nero suspects that of being unfair Turns out to be right about that. And there's also this amazing little vignette. I mean, and his life story is filled with these anecdotes. But you you may remember when he gets to Egypt, he issues a proclamation to the army right before the Battle of the Pyramids. And he says to the soldiers, from these pyramids, 40 centuries look down upon you. 
it's a mystery as to how he almost to the T correctly gets the age of the pyramids. <laughs> Right. This, despite being something like 80 or 90 years before modern archaeology would make about the same that it's probably the 42 or 43 centuries so another another of these vignettes but yes deeply learned and deeply read uh in the ancients plutarch above all sits uh on his pantheon and cornelius nepos there's others i mean he read livy he read thucydides he read herodotus etc but nothing comes close to, to plutarch for him Oh, that's interesting because Plutarch, uh, Plutarch's so entertaining, and you know yeah. the the paired lives so influential on Shakespeare. I wondered with you writing this book, which I'm not suggesting for a moment you've you read every book that Napoleon had read, but did you find books that he had he had been fascinated by, and you know this is now adding to your reading list that is getting ever longer and longer and longer, and and just inwardly grown. And think this is this is just becoming a massive project. A absolutely, uh, it's it's of course one can never read everything he read. One because we don't know for sure everything he read. Uh, we have thousands of names that he requests and books that he reads and any comments, but one just simply cannot. But yes, I have had to chew through a lot of his reading list. Uh, most of them are wonderful books. Obviously, there's great classics that were incredibly famous in the 19th century, which are today have completely disappeared from modern bookstores and general readership, despite them being, I mean, the Harry Potter of uh, their age. So for example, he absolutely loves the poems of Ossian. Ossian being a fake bard, a sort of Scottish Homer, who supposedly operated and wrote in the first century and told the tales, Gaelic tales of great heroes, etc. He, he's the Scottish antique Homer. Now, Ossian at the time of Napoleon was published by a man called James McPherson. And James McPherson said, oh, I didn't write these poems. I found them, I dissected them. I went to these Gaelic little towns in Scotland in the Highlands and translated them and reworked them. We now know that's a lie and that McPherson invented all of them and he was and he is now known as a literary fraudster. I've talked about this to Andrew Roberts and it, it, Mr. Roberts is a great point. He's like, it's a great mystery. If McPherson has said, I wrote those, today he would be considered one of the greatest poets of the 19th century, of the 18th century, excuse me. But he lied. And so now he's unknown and, and seen as a con and, and a fraudster. So for example, disappeared to nobody reads of CN today. Napoleon absolutely adored them. I've had to, to chew my, myself through some Ossian. I, not my taste too much. I I am I I love Homer. I'm I'm obsessed with Homer. Uh, Napoleon says uh, Homer has nothing on Ossian. Homer is vulgar compared to Ossian. I disagree with Napoleon completely. I mean Homer. Yeah, he's got that wrong. Much. much I mean, I've not read Ossian, so I should just say that first up. I'm... You can, but it's 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 a bit uh, it's repetitive and. Right. Uh, a little, little keech and do, uh, do you think do you think because the Iliad certainly has so much I guess pathos for warfare and fighting and is that something that Napoleon wouldn't be interested in because no, no he was he was very much interested he in fact the one of the only good things he says about the Iliad is that militarily speaking it's incredibly realistic that's what he says, but he he is less seduced by its uh, wonderful writing and this and the music of a um, of the of the writing. Mm. Uh, multiple occasions, he says, Ossian is much superior, um, and he also says it's superior to to, to Shakespeare. I mean, he was enthused with. He commissions paintings of Ossian. He commissions an opera. Uh, his he, many of his libraries had had paintings of Ossian and the busts and the, the name. He was in love with the with the guy. Uh, I'm, I'm, and actually on St. Helena, there is a Scottish uh, lady there, I forget exactly who, and um, he goes up to her immediately, obviously, and in typical Napoleonic fashion, he learns that she's Scottish, he says, oh, the, is it true what they say about MacPherson that he invented the poems, tell me, have you read Ossian, what do you think about Ossian, is Ossian read in England, what? a million, a barrage of questions, and she tells him, oh, you know, sire, apparently it, it is an, an invention. Uh, and it's a fabrication. And he seems to be disappointed uh, about that revelation. So he, he definitely liked the history as much of the writing in Ossian. But he also read, um, he was obsessed with, and I've had to read those, and I, I, I was so glad to be done with that part of the book. Uh, he was obsessed with romances. 
particularly Rousseau's novel La Nouvelle Héloïse, sometimes called Julie, which is, I mean, the most melodramatic uh, sort of quiche love story you can imagine. But since when Rousseau wrote it, it had never been written. People read this and it was the most, you know, controversial, taboo. I mean, it, it was borderline, you know, pornographic uh, for, for the audience of the time. I mean, the, the, talking about infidelity and love so all-consuming, it leads one to suicide. Uh, I mean, this was completely new for Rousseau's readership. Uh, Napoleon loved those, those, those books. I mean, he, he read also Paul et Virginie, uh, a similar novel where, you know, the the, the the couple drowns saving each other in the in the in the water. I mean, it's very romantic. We would you know sort of raise our eyes when we see that today. It's like my God, it's been done a million times. But back then, it was it was a huge deal. That was from Bernadette Saint Pierre, uh, and it's part of another interesting facet of his character, which is uh, this guy could be on a battlefield, directing a battle. There is you know twenty thousand casualties. He's sending a million orders as to the the incredibly complex movement and logistics of armies. And, you know, at night, he's reading a love story uh, about a, a Swiss noble woman who falls in love with her tutor. And he says, you know, the, I've read this book eight times. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's Escapism, a, I suppose. It, it, it completely. Uh, that's what yeah. I suspect uh, as well. But also a very touching aspect of his character, almost childlike aspect of his character. And I, I suspect to, to the charge that he was a tyrant and a bloodthirsty warmonger. Um, many things could be responded to that because, of course, that is a, a complete BS argument. But one of the arguments I've often used is that tyrants don't cry, Barbar you know, barbaric warlords and, and soulless people don't cry over La Nouvelle Héloïse and uh, Paul et Virginie. They don't read cheeky romances and find them to be amazing. They simply uh don't. You saying this, it, it makes me... Did, did he read Don Quixote? Um, because that's... I wonder, yeah, I, I just wonder if if that's something that he would have liked because it rather satirizes those kind of romances, doesn't it? So he he, he must have, uh, but I don't know off the top of my head. He's not a fan of satire, right? He well, he's he's a victim of ruthless satire on these shores. Yes, yes, and when he's on um, the Northumberland, the English ship taking him to Saint Helena, he discovers the English satire that his censorship had tried to siphon out for the totality of his reign, and he reads them with great amusement. Uh, but of course, he must have known that they, they did irreparable damage to his reputation and persists to this day. I mean, the myth that he was short is almost wholly a product of English uh, satirical uh, cartoonists, uh, and of course, the warmonger argument, etc. The, 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 the Ridley Scott movie uh, is pretty much the culmination of English 19th century political cartoons. That's what it is. I mean, that's if you buy their version of events, then the movie makes uh, more sense. Yeah, I was, I mean, I don't want to dwell on the movie too much because we've done it to death on this podcast and it's been stabbed to death as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, although I, I secretly quite enjoyed it, but I thought it was, ah. I, th I thought it was a bit of a comedy. I don't think he was uh, being serious, but anyway, uh, he's a, he's a very inarticulate Napoleon in, in that film, I think. And he was reading throughout his life, but w was there a, I mean, one assumes that St. Helena, you know, where he's there for six years till his death, uh, one, one assumes that's where he reads the most, but I mean, do we know how many books he read in total? And do you have a rough idea? Yes. Ah. So uh, this is the great tragedy. Um, and it's the great tragedy of my story as well, because the man is a voracious, obsessive reader. But I, I really want this to sink in with people. It, it's not that he read a lot. It's that he read like he was a maniac. Every aspect of his life was constantly framed by books. When he makes a political decision, when he organizes his marriage to Marie-Louise, when he plans battles, when he makes legal reforms, he constantly goes to books to set a precedent or to follow a historical precedent, to guide his actions, to inform his campaigns. They were literal levels, levers of power. He read for pleasure, he loved reading, but he also inculcated reading in every aspect of his reign and his military campaigns. And so one figures 
that when he gets in exile and he no longer has all these great responsibilities, reading would occupy most of his time. And it did. The problem is that this is also the first time since he was a teenager that he had legitimate problem acquiring new books. So he gets to St. Helena. Uh, I mean, in the couple of days after Waterloo uh, and uh, after the second abdication, he frantically tries to get books because he knows he's going to get exiled again. So um, he tries to collect books from the various imperial libraries, and he manages to, to get around four or 500. And they also order some books. They, they, they have a layover in Madeira in Portugal, where they also order some books. But he gets to St. Helena. He has about 580 books, which is enough to last us mere mortals a lifetime. With him, within a couple of months, he's, he's out. He's out of material. It's a bit like you're about to go on a long haul flight and you're trying to load up your, your disc space with movies and he's used up all his space and yeah. he's in the first two hours of the flight. Yes, yes. Except uh, in his day and age, you can't download the movie and, you know, United mm -hmm. Airlines is not going to give you, you know, Dunkirk uh, for free. They're rather hard to get. Uh, so he gets to St. Helena. He has 580 books. He runs through them at withering speed. Um, and now becomes the great drought, where he constantly requests for new books. The first shipment of books he gets, ironically, is the one-year anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo in 1816. Uh, so there's a frigate, the HMS Newcastle, which pulls into St. Helena, and that's the first new shipment of books. He is so excited that he opens the boxes with hammers and scissors himself. Now, to a modern audience, that's like, oh, you know, that's funny. But I really want your listeners to let that fact detonate in their brains. The idea that the emperor would open the boxes himself is surreal. It doesn't happen, right, in 19th century Europe. It, it simply does not happen, right? It's not like, you know, the president getting an Amazon package and opening it. No, it does not. So it just speaks to his insane excitement at getting new reading material. He gets the new books. He stays up all night reading them. The next morning at like 7 a.m., we have Marchand who gets into his room and he says he sees all the books in Napoleon's rooms, you know, on the floor, on the bed, on the tables open. And Napoleon, like a child on Christmas morning, like going from book to book. And he looks at Marchand and he says, oh, I read them with the thumb. I mean, you know, he was so excited to get through them that he just rifled through all of them. And then after that, there's another great drought. And then he just is going to rely on very periodic book shipments from admirers, including uh, Lord and Lady Holland, which send them books. Uh, the Count of Las Cases, who's exiled from St. Helena, is expelled from St. Helena, also sends him uh, books. A couple other people send him books. He makes constant requests to uh, Sir Hudson Lowe, the governor of the island, uh, and the British are very reticent to give him book, a rather cruel. In fact, a, a major factor in the um, the uh, detrimental nature of their relationship with Hudson Lowe, of the deterioration, sorry, of their relationship, is books. It's one of their first fights. Uh, when Napoleon tells them, you know, I have a thousand books here. This is this library does not fit a man of my position. I need 60,000 books and the resources of a great city. Uh, and 60,000, of course, being the number of books he had compiled as emperor. And he remembered that number because he had organized these great libraries himself, basically, with the help of his loyal librarian. So it's a great factor in the deterioration of their relationship. It's a great factor in his growing depression. Uh, and it's it will be his last true um, suffering, his last true misery in his life will be the lack of reading material. He reads up until the end. He reads up until the last days or weeks of his life, but he will always have trouble getting new books. So I wanted to ask you, I was speaking to Adam Zamoyski about historiography in France at the moment, and he was saying that there's a slightly strange interpretation of, of Napoleon in France nowadays, in that it's not necessarily, I, I'm not sure pride is the right word, but sort of appreciation of the impact of Napoleon, maybe, and I'm using sort of very general terms here. Mm. Um, but I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on where history writers are with Napoleon today. I mean, we've seen the rise increasingly in this country of certain elements damning of the mere existence of the British Empire, for example. Yeah. Is there a similar kind of movement in France that, yes. you know, everything Napoleon did is wrong and, and, and yes. we should be ashamed? 
So Jean Tullard, the legendary Napoleonic historian who's still alive, I, I was just at one of his talks. The man is like 99 years old or 92 years old. I forget exactly his age, but still withering energy. I mean, an incredible man. And his his work is just encyclopedic. I mean, this is a, so that's a point he made years ago is that each new generation studies Napoleon through their own lens. So in the 1960s, it was all about his relationship to women and feminism. And then a little later, it was about his relationship to the economy in the 1980s and 90s. And today, of course, we see him through the social justice lens. And the big questions of slavery come back and colonialism come back and his alleged racism and sexism. It's a great shame. Uh, it's a great shame because, as my friend, uh, another Napoleonic historian, Arthur Chevalier, has said, these people are not historians. The, the, the activists who want us to stop talking about the man and the era, these are not people who spend 30 years studying sources. No, they're people who jump into the subject superficially, latch on to one controversial, one problematic aspect, and then tear him apart. And then they criticize us for being interested in his legacy. It's almost as if, if you have a historical character whose one problematic opinion, one problematic action, it disqualifies everything else. Well, I ask these people, if that is the case, if that is the standard, if that is the conception we have of our own history, who exactly passes the test? Name me one figure in world history who has the morality of 2024, who is exactly our current understanding of sexual relations and racial relations and colonialism and imperialism and democratic liberalism. It, find me one, find me one regime. It doesn't exist. So either we throw everything away or we approach the subject with some maturity and some modesty, because the same people who criticize him for his alleged racism and colonialism and sexism, by the way, those, those are very dubious claims, I'm happy to talk about them, have absolutely no idea what our descendants will look upon us as. Maybe we will be the great criminals to our descendants. Now, this is tremendous arrogance, absolutely poor uh, historiography. These people do not spend time studying the sources. They don't read people of differing opinions. They're activists. And they're terrified of history. I don't exactly know why. You know, Thierry Lenz, the director of the Fondation Napoléon, said this to me. He said, they're afraid of history. What exactly is there to be afraid of? I mean, we, we can study. The, yeah. Did he reinstitute slavery? Yes. Did he forbid mixed marriages? Yes. Did he make problematic comments about women? In fact, did he have a problematic view of the role of woman in society? Is the view of woman in the Napoleonic Code subservient to man? Yes. What else do you want? What, what else do you want? Now, can we understand the context? Now, can we compare the morality of the time? Now, can we talk about other subjects? I mean, the, the, these people who want to approach the subject of history with placards and signs, no, I mean, I have no patience for these people. And unfortunately, it, it's very common in France now, especially in our media. We, we had in uh, 2021, the bicentennial of his death. And you had the President Macron gave a, a really good speech uh, and a very honorable speech, uh, saying Napoleon is part of us, a very admirable uh, moment for Macron, in my opinion. But you had all the pundits and the media people talking about, you know, that he was this insufferable racist, which he absolutely was not. He was this disgusting sexist, which he absolutely was not. Uh, he was this great colonialist, which he absolutely was not. I mean, this is this is absurd. I mean, all this is nonsense. Yeah, it's quite interesting learning about uh, what's going on in France then from a history angle, because you know, particularly with social media, where you only got a few characters to put your pithy um, opinion on on uh, a, a figure so complicated as Napoleon, yes. um, that of course you're going to rely on sound bites. But uh, yeah, I, guess I, I read a very good book came out in about two or three years ago, the biography of Toussaint Louverture, Black yes. Spartacus um, himself, a, a slave owner. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Anybody and... who doesn't believe uh, me, me and you can, can look up the facts, read a biography. He owned and operated slaves, right? Yes. When, when that fact is known, suddenly, ah, oh, wait, so history is subtlety. Well, it's, a, it's a gray area. Oh, really? Not everything is, is indeed, black. Indeed, it is center. certainly complicated. I mean, you know, I, I, I think the arc of history, what, we always assume that, you know, we're at the, uh, or at the moral end Forgetting, you know, time moves forward and in 200 years, we're going to be viewed as 
as probably barbarians by some. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, but that book on on Tuzan Louverture was quite eye opening for me on on because I think I had come at Napoleon from a kind of well, he's sort of quite progressive when one compares his reforms, the Napoleonic reforms that you mentioned earlier, compared with you know our, our somewhat sort of conservative small C monarchy under George III at the time. And his treatment of Toussaint Louverture was actually, you know, an important reminder that he is not this island of progressivism, is he, Napoleon? He's a much more complicated figure than that. Of, of course. Having said that, I would make the argument he was incredibly progressive for the time. Does he have black spots, errors, mistakes, lapses of judgment or moral character? Yes. Who exactly doesn't? But still, he's the man who abolishes feudalism. He's the man who toys with the Tsar Alexander to abolish serfdom. He's the man who closes down the ghettos in the Papal States. He's the man who bans slavery um, in uh, on the island of Malta. And he bans slavery again in 1815 when he comes back to power. Nobody talks about that. Uh, the, the, the question of Haiti is a very interesting one. Uh, it's, a, it's probably one of the darkest stains on his legacy for good reason. Um, it, very close to to a crime that but that army sent forty thousand strong defeated ignominious crimes committed on both sides but still of course purely colonial venture by the French but one must understand why and it's very understand it's very easy to understand why when you understand the economic aspects of uh, Saint Domingue now called Haiti I think Saint Domingue accounted for something like forty percent of the world's sugar production. You say this to people and, you know, they're looking for some moral argument. You won't find that in, in history most of the time. Of course, it was abominable. But 40% of sugar, that is an economic explosion, right? That is the, the well in Qatar filled with oil, right? That, that was one of the most expensive commodities at the time. Any monarch would have done everything he could to secure that income at the lowest possible cost. Not only him. Is it still a crime according to our modern standards? Obviously. Was he still wrong according to our modern standards? Obviously. But these things must be understood within the context of their time. And when compared with other rulers, he does not stand out as particularly barbaric or racist. In fact, not at all racist. I, I, I talk about this to some pretty extensive length in the book. The Egyptian expedition, while yes, a colonial venture, no doubt about it, is the first hearts and mind campaigns uh, in history. His tactic for wooing the Egyptians is bewildering in its modernity and pluralism. Now, you might say it's cynical. Of course it's cynical. But still, compared to everything else that happened in human history, he issues translated versions of the Quran to the yeah, French. Yeah, he claims great interest in the Quran, but one, one isn't sure if that's true or not, really. Is it? It, 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 is, it is true, and at the same time, it's uh, cynical colonialism. Yeah, Again, yeah. it's ambivalent. It's true that he was a big, he, he loved Muhammad as a man, as a great man. This is to be viewed in the same lens that we see his admiration for Julius Caesar or Alexander. He loved great men who achieved, who built for their people. Muhammad, according to Napoleon, was a great warrior, a great statesman who took his people out of obscurity and gave them a great empire. Of course he loved them. Voltaire writes a play uh, called Mohammed, uh, also called Fanaticism, where Voltaire just absolutely, you know, ruins Mohammed, portrays him as a manipulator, uh, a, a deceiver who manipulates the faith his followers have in him and gets him. It's a very, very critical play. Napoleon thought it was scandalous. Napoleon hated the play. He thought he had denigrated everything in the play, he says. Uh, he gets to Egypt, tells the soldiers, treat the imams as we treated the rabbis and the priests in Europe. He says, it, 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 here the men have different practices in love, but in every country, the rapist is a monster. This is in 1799, that, that phrase. The Russian army today is, is, is using rape as a weapon of war. And then of, he was incredibly progressive in some aspects um, of the time. Now, of course, this was also cynical colonialism. It was a tactic to try to woo the Egyptian population. But out of all of the other tactics he could have considered, this one was pretty darn progressive. It, is, it was a hearts and minds campaign uh, and, and very interesting. He, he talks with the imams at length 
uh, you know, he 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 gets an official title, an Islamic title. He, he's called, I think, Abu Napoleon. The great Imam of Cairo says that in truth he is the great great nephew of the Prophet. I mean, at some point he comes out to a staff meeting and he's wearing loose Mamluk trousers and a turban and a curved swords, and his entire staff just starts laughing uncontrollably, and he's super vexed by that and changes out of it reluctantly. Um, and and even uh, one on Saint Helena, he makes this lunar comment so arrogant but also so amusing he says um you know if 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 i had the, the time and the power uh we would have written to india india uh i would have written to india on an elephant uh with an edited quran to suit my needs so he wanted to edit the quran create a new religion and make a new empire in the east following in the footsteps of alexander that complete yeah. fantasy of course but this is this is not the racist uh, that that we are being portrayed. This is a man of incredible complexity and often incredible modernity. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, I was just thinking how Alexandrian that all was. So, Louis, th this has been fantastic. Now, for listeners who may be thinking, Louis sounds, there's obviously a French uh, element to your accent there, but it's very Americanized as well. And we were just saying before we started recording, or a wonderful blend of the old alliance of America and France. Uh, you've been schooled in America, am I right? So I left France when I was um, about 11 years old, and uh, I came pretty much straight away to a military academy in Pennsylvania, Valley Forge Military Academy, where I spent four years, and that was a proper uh, American brainwashing, uh, and, uh, and I'm afraid I fell completely victim to it. I am an American citizen uh, and a proud American patriot. And so you must learn a lot about the American Civil War during your time at the Academy in Pennsylvania, where so many battles took place. Yeah, not as much as, as uh, you would think, although, of course, um, we, we, we are very near to Gettysburg. Uh, but my, my study of the American Civil War came a little later. Uh, I am obsessed with that. that That's yeah, amazing. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, just a bewildering play. A very tragic and horrible and also beautiful uh, and inspiring play. Uh, Shelby Foote called it the crossroads of our being, uh, said it was the most important moment in American history. I, I think he's completely right. Uh, it is a fascinating episode, and it is an episode that uh, countless of our fellow Europeans will never understand and never understand. It is very poorly studied in Europe, and it, it, it almost if you were to, to approach uh, your average Frenchman or Englishman or, or French woman or English woman, and, and and described it to them, they would have a, a huge amount of trouble understanding. I mean, we've had our civil wars. I wouldn't teach the Englishmen about civil wars, but ours were incredibly tame when compared with the massive dynamic of the civil war. I mean, they, they kill 700,000 of their own citizens. And officers who, who grew up together at West Point, fighting on opposite sides, families split down the middle, a, a savagery, a hatred, uh, it just it just that that is terrifying, and this is recent history. I mean, this, as the phrase goes, everything after eighteen hundred is current events. But this is not, you know, we're not talking about the Middle Ages here or, or a thousand years before Christ. This is almost within uh, uh, within a couple of generations of living memory. Uh, I think the last Civil War veteran died uh, in the nineteen fifties. This is just very recent, so it's a fascinating uh, moment. We, we, my wife and I, take pilgrimages to the. Uh, Civil War battlefields. We live in Maryland, so Antietam is a, is a beautifully preserved and very nice battlefield that I encourage anybody to visit. You can stand on the, the side of the main Confederate battery, and contrary to other battlefields, it's very clear to understand from the topography uh, what went on, and, and they do a, gr a great job over there of conserving it. So yeah, it's, it's a fascinating uh, episode, and I wish more Europeans would, would learn about it. Yeah, well, I definitely, for listeners who are interested in this, I'm definitely planning to get some American Civil War content on, on the on the channel. Uh, Louis, this is great. I, what's next? Do you want to write another book or are you looking at a different type of career? Well, uh, funny that you should ask about the Civil War. I am currently, I've just signed a contract uh, with a French publishing house uh, about a military history of the United States. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful. From, the from the revolution to the Islamic State. Well, that's going to be, uh, that's that's quite a big subject. That is a massive subject, uh, one I am wholly unprepared for, uh, but I'm never one to deny uh, an opportunity. So I will be sure to bite into it and, and do my best. 
Well, uh, thanks so much for joining me. This has been this has been great talking Napoleon's Library, the book Napoleon's Library, the Emperor, his books and their influence on the Napoleonic era. It's out in May, but you can pre-order it. There are links in the show notes for listeners. And Louis, best of luck with this and with the project that you've got going. Oliver, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for listening. Please do rate and review. And if you've got any feedback, please do get in touch. In the meantime, thank you and good night. <laughs>